Good morning, everyone. Oh, dear. This is your first session. I was expecting more energy than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your day. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I am a psychologist, a performance coach. Uh, I'm very lucky. I get the opportunity to travel around and I work with some very good sports teams and business teams. Uh, and I guess what I do is I help people cultivate a mindset for success. So I say for us to act differently, we need to think differently. So for us to optimize our potential as a leader and that of our teams, we need to cultivate a way of thinking to enable a different way of doing. So I guess what I do is I help people change their mind as much as anything else. Although it's tricky, isn't it? It's difficult because we all think differently anyway. Different thoughts, different ideas, different opinions. We've all got different ways of seeing the world. Let me give you an example. Um, here's an example for you. A couple of weeks ago, I stayed with a friend of mine. I haven't seen this friend in a long time, not since university days. Uh, I've never met his wife before, uh, but they are, what's the word? They are spiritualists. They believe in crystal healing. Very spiritual people, holistic. Showing me around their house, into each room, going to the bedroom, everywhere is red. Red carpets, red bedspread, red walls, red curtains. Of course you ask, why the red? And do you know what she said? This is brilliant. She said that when you pull these red curtains in the morning and the sun comes in, it's as if you are being reborn every day. Pull these red curtains in the morning, the sun comes in, it's as if you are emerging from the womb. I thought it was quite a nice sentiment. <laughs> I quite liked it until I told my wife about it. She reminded me we've got brown curtains at home. I think there are different perspectives. There are different ways of seeing life, different ways of seeing business. Uh, I've got three ideas for you this morning. Kick this off for you. I never know what to call them. What should we call them? Three ideas, three principles. Uh, three principles to share with you this morning. That's what I've got. Hey, but look, before I get started, I always like to take the temperature of the room. I always like to try and understand the mood of the audience. I mean, this is your first session. I mean, you've got two days here. Um, what should we do? Um, actually, here's one for you. Um, if you're, look, if you're really wanting a good couple of days today, the uh, next two days, a really good conference, um, why don't you just shake hands with the person next to you and uh, introduce yourself and say, have a great couple of days. Have a great couple of days. Let's do that. Shake hands with the person next to you. Just have a great couple of days. Hi, I'm, let's have a, let me see the mood of the room. Let me do, hey, do you know, no, whoa, 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 sorry, sorry. Actually, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Actually, having listened to Sean, so having listened to Sean, I think it should be a great two days. It should be a high five, not a shake hands. High five. High five the person next to you and say, have a great two days. Have a great two days. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Actually, you know, I think you could have a better two days if you maybe had a little hug, a little cuddle. <laughs> a little kiss on the lips. I'm pushing it too far, aren't I? I'm pushing it too far. I've got three ideas, three principles to share with you. And, uh, and I'm going to ask for you to make a one degree of change. What's that? I hear you cry. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? I hear you mumble disinterestedly. <laughs> one degree of change. change. If you take two parallel lines, you move one by one degree. It may not seem much at first. There is a big difference between where you start and where you end up. Everyone is trying to start something or stop something. We think to be better as a team, as a leader, as a business, as a person, we need to start things, stop things. From tomorrow, I will be different. Tomorrow, I'm going to start doing this, stop doing that. Do it in business all the time. Talk about green light, red light behavior. I think the route to greater success is to do something a little bit more occasionally, if we remember. This is easy self-help this morning, isn't it? Why don't you do something a little bit more, occasionally, if you remember? I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Actually, you know what? On a more serious note, um, I have worked with six people who have got to number one in the world. I promise you now, not one of them has said, from tomorrow, I'm going to be different. From tomorrow, start doing this, 
and make a sea change, do something dramatic. Every single one of them has said, I'm going to do this a little bit more. And maybe I'll just do this a bit more consistently. Driving greater change, greater results from incremental improvement. That's what it's been about. And do you know what? We think to be better, we need to fix our weaknesses. Hello, how are you? You've missed nothing. It's been rubbish up until now. It only gets good at this point. And then, but I tell you, we think to be better, we need to fix our weaknesses. We think to be better, we need to close the gaps in our business or in our team. I don't believe that's true. I think it's about understanding our strengths and playing to them. Understanding what it is that we already do well. I've actually worked with teams before who have weakened a strength by trying to strengthen a weakness. Think about it. It's ludicrous, isn't it? Actually, weaken the strength by trying to strengthen a weakness. We need to be careful. I think the route to be better is a bit of self-awareness, a bit of personal introspection. For those of you who don't like personal introspection, you should take a long, hard look at yourself. <laughs> it's very important. But anyway, three ideas, three principles. Um, do you know what? I'm going to ask you to make a one degree of change. Do you have pen and paper with you? You've got a pen and paper, it's quite handy. Uh, or use your phones. I don't mind you using phones if they're on silent. I don't mind you using your phones. So they take a note because I want you to write down one word, one sentence, one idea that you think is okay. One idea, one principle in the 45 minutes we have together. You know what? I might be able to use it. I think it's okay. That's all I'm after. Do you know what? I'll make this even easier for you. You don't need to write it down in the 45 minutes, your one idea, one sentence on principle, one word. You don't need to write that down. I'm a great believer in success comes from the collective. Sean talked about networking, being more connected, an opportunity to be together. I think success comes from the collective. People say to me, what is success? I say success is about making the connection between two things previously unconnected. That's my definition of success. Make the connection between two things previously unconnected. Uh, two ideas coming together, two people coming together who don't usually talk, don't usually connect. Sharing ideas, arguing, debating, allowing knowledge to flow, create new opportunities, new possibilities. That's what success is for me. I do a lot of work at Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard used to say, if Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard knows, we would be three times more successful. How true is that of any organization, any community? If only we knew what everyone else knows, we had access to it. Do you imagine all the wisdom, expertise, and experience in this room now? Imagine if we could place that on one table, all have access to it. How successful could we all become? It'd be amazing. Allowing knowledge to flow within a community, within an organization, become a new asset class. I honestly believe that companies no longer compete against companies. I see that particularly in the tech world, by the way. Companies no longer compete against companies. Networks compete against networks. You're only as strong as your network. There's an external narrative on that in regard to uh, your organization, your company. But there's an internal narrative too as a leader, manager. You're only as strong as the partnerships that you can forge in this room with your suppliers and partners. The stronger that network more successful you become, allowing knowledge to flow, argue, debate, share, create better and bigger outcomes than you could create on your own. I believe that our only sustainable competitive advantage is to learn faster and better than your competitors. How can you do that if you're not sharing, arguing, debating, allowing knowledge to be a new asset class? Hey, but look, I promised you three principles, I promised you three ideas. I'm trying to make the case for you to stay connected, enjoy your two days together, share, argue, debate, talk to as many people as you can. That's where success comes from. But let's get on with our three ideas. Shall we get on with our three ideas? All say yes. Yes, yes. yes. perfect, okay. Oh, by the way, I am a scribbler. Sean's right, that I don't use um, PowerPoint overheads, um, movies, I, I just tend to scribble. My name's Jamil, I'm a scribbler. I said it, I feel better now. It just feels like one of those groups, doesn't it? That's all. I, I will let you into a secret. I have been booed off before. I've had the indignity of being booed off. I had this girl once going, boo, get off, you're rubbish. Boo, get off, you're rubbish. We were in the bedroom at the time. <laughs> Actually, just for the girls in the audience, that's just a joke. 
First idea I want to share with you is the idea of inner dialogue. Oh no, he is a performance coach. He is a psychologist. He's going to talk about positive mental attitude in the workplace as a leader. No, I'm not actually. I don't really believe in positive mental attitude. I don't believe in positive thinking, all the work I've done in high performance. One day I'll write a book called The Power of Negative Thinking, but that's another story. I do believe that this though, I do believe that we think, we feel, and then we act. This is how you work. This is how your users work, technology. This is how uh, your suppliers work. This is how your customers work, prospects work in this way. Your team members work in this way. Your family members, your children will be doing this. You will be doing this. We think and then we feel and then we act. All our actions and behaviors come from how we feel. That comes from the words and pictures in our head. So we think in words and we think in pictures. It makes us feel a particular way and then we act upon it. In regard to the words, we speak at a rate of 80 to 100 words a minute to ourselves almost all the time. But our minds are like soil. Whatever thought we plant will nourish and grow. This is why we need to be careful. So we think in words and pictures, makes us feel a particular way, and then we act upon it. People say to me all the time, how do I get people to adopt this technology? And use it. How do I get my teams to be more collaborative? How do I get these teams to work together? How do I elevate the status of this team in this organization? Bless you. How do I get my sales guys to be more customer focused? I say, the smart leader doesn't work in here at all in regard to people's actions, but works in here in regard to their words and pictures in their head. Driving sustainable change, allowing people to adopt behaviors which are meaningful, purposeful, sustainable, long-term. If you want to change the behaviors in your team, you want to change the behaviors for yourself, change the behaviors, your wider executive and internal business partners, you can choose to work in here, telling people to be different. You can choose to work in here, changing the words and pictures in people's heads. It is the difference between compliance and commitment when it comes to dealing with change. The difference between compliance and commitment. We tell people to be different all the time, don't we? Say to our team members, be more collaborative. Does it work? We say to ourselves to be different. Say to our children, you should tidy your rooms. Does it work? No. Say to ourselves to be different all the time, don't we? We say to ourselves, we should drink less. We should smoke less. We should eat healthier. We should go to the gym more. Does it work? Look at the people next to you. No, it doesn't. <laughs> what? What? What I say? Actually, here's one for you. How many of you are driving along and you see a speed camera, you see the markings that follow the speed camera, and you slow down? How many of you slow down when you drive through a speed camera? Very good. Excellent. Good. How many of you get to the end of those markings? Look in the rear view mirror and speed up. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Shall I tell you why you do that? As a psychologist, shall I tell you why you do that? The reason why you do that is that you are more concerned at not getting a 60 euro speed in fine than you are providing a safe society for our children. <laughs> you shits. <laughs> but you know what? We all do it. Companies will spend a fortune on behavioral frameworks. Companies will spend a fortune telling people to be different. Governments will spend a fortune telling us to pay our taxes, telling us not to take drugs, not to smoke. The reason why it doesn't change how people do it doesn't change how they view it. Let me give you another example of this to prove this to be true. If two people set up a business, these businesses are exactly the same. They sell the same product, same geography, same distribution channels, same pricing points, everything is the same. Apart from the motivation of the business leaders. This business leader says, this business has got to work. If it does, I could be financially independent in a few years' time. 
Business has got to work. If it does, then I could move to America. But a market will be right within three years. Business has got to work. I could buy a dream home in New Zealand. Business has got to work. If it does, I could get more time off with my children. Upgrade the house. I could upgrade the car. Upgrade the partner, whatever it might be. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> same business, same geography, same distribution channels, same pricing points. Everything is the same. Apart from the motivation of this leader, this leader says, business has got to work. And if it doesn't, I could go bankrupt. I might have to make redundancies. I might have to downsize or downgrade. If this business doesn't work, my friends will laugh at me. This person is motivated by what they're seeking to achieve. This person is motivated by what they're seeking to avoid. My experience, people who get to number one in the world, people who perform at exceptional levels in business or in sport, more often than not, are motivated by what they're seeking to achieve, not motivated by what they're seeking to avoid. Why? We're talking think, feel, and act. The reason why is that we are drawn towards our most dominant thoughts. Expectation becomes reality. We get what we think about. That's how it works. How do these words make you feel? Redundancy, bankruptcy, downsizing, failure. Make you feel pretty awful, don't they? Make you feel pretty shitty. Even if you are trying to move away from them. Try to move away from them you are more likely to get them. Our subconscious mind as human beings, the people that you manage and lead, the people that you coach and train, yourselves, our subconscious mind as human beings never hears the word not or don't. We never ever hear the word not or don't. It's the old one, um, don't think of a white bear. Don't think of a dog, guys. We need to construct a thought to deconstruct it. We need to think about it to not think about it. If you put into Google, do not show me pictures of white bears. Perfect example of how our brain works. Do you know, uh, I work with three golfers who are inside the top 10 in the world. I promise you now, not one of them will stand on the first tee and say, don't hit it left. Don't drop it in the water. You amateur golfers know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? I feel the pain in the room. Don't miss this putt. I said, do you know, I spent a lot of time with the late and great Gary Speed. You know Gary Speed? Football player, soccer player. He was a great football player. Um, but he was a world-class penalty taker. Not a lot of people know that. Taking the spot kick, the penalty in football, he was fabulous. World class. If ever you spoke to him about taking penalties, he would say, when I know I'm going to take a penalty, I ask myself a question. I put a question on loop, it repeats in my head, but I don't answer it as I run towards the ball, probably two strides away from kicking the ball. The answer will just come to me. He had an 11 pace run up, two strides from kicking the ball, the answer popped into his head. The question that he would ask himself before each penalty was which way will I run, left or right, to celebrate having scored this goal? So he would see success take place in his head rather than running at the ball, saying don't scuff it, don't hit it over the top of the goalpost, don't hit it at the goalkeeper. How many times in business do we make decisions based upon mitigating risk? How many times do we make decisions based upon what we stand to lose? This is a really good idea, guys. We haven't brought these two communities, these two teams together before. What if it goes wrong? Hey, now this is really interesting using a smaller supplier, and more nimble and more agile. What if it goes wrong? What do we stand to lose? Shouldn't we just buy the big guys safer? We stand to lose less if it goes wrong. Hey, this is a really good idea in regard to uh, data, analytics, insight, and using it to understand this particular area for our HR um, uh, directorate. But you know what? Uh, what if it takes too much time? What do we stand to lose? What's not happening in our business if this goes wrong? I guess there's something else that we stand to lose. Time, money, 
market share, revenue, income, all those things. But as a leader, something else too, isn't there? Reputation, status, how we're going to look in front of our friends, colleagues. When we start to buy a supplier in, when we start to think in new ways, start to innovate in our management practices, start to adopt newer technology. We always risk something, don't we? But I guess that we need to, to commit to a growth mindset. This is about maintenance. This is about staying still. And you know in technology there is no staying still. The universe has no neutral when it comes to technology. Everything you do takes you forwards or takes you backwards. Every single, these two days together now will take you closer to your goals or it will take you further away. You could have been doing something else with your time, couldn't you? I guess we always invest something in this space here. Staying still is not enough. Being compliant, ticking the boxes, maintaining a position. You come away after your two days with great ideas, great plans, new ideas. You go back, if people are looking to maintain a position, can't execute upon those ideas. I spent a lot of time in 2008 I was uh, working in financial services. I was working with a lot of people who were walking to work trying not to lose their jobs. Can you imagine? Can you imagine now if you had people in your teams who are walking to work trying not to lose their jobs? I don't want to lose this account. I don't want to lose this client. I don't want to lose this pitch. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my position in this team. I think people who think like that feel nervous. I think they act upon it. I think they tick the boxes do enough, maintain a position, try and stay safe, protectionism. Doesn't commit to growth mindset, doesn't commit to outperforming the competition, doesn't commit to new and expansive and creative and ambitious thinking, which elevates the status of our particular department or directorate in the eyes of the business. Stay still, that's all, protectionism. By the way, if you've got silo working in any one of your teams, I pretty much guarantee it will come from that sort of mentality. It come from that sort of thinking. Um, you work in businesses which have high technical expertise. Uh, here's an example of why silo thinking will, may take place. If I was working in your business and high technical expertise was valuable, why should I share my uh, expertise with you? Why should I share my knowledge with you? Because if you know it too, I have devalued myself. So therefore, I'll keep it to myself. Best ways of working, best ways around service level agreements, best ways to mobilize talent. If you know it too, I've devalued me. Make sure it's important that I know it and no one else does. Silo working, I see it all the time in technical businesses. Dream home in New Zealand, moving to America, financial independence, the rewards of winning, whatever they may be. I think the person who thinks like this feels different. I think they're more likely to act upon it. I think they are more likely to be expansive and ambitious in the way in which they think, the products they buy, and the way in which they engage with the communities that mobilize them around those products, solutions. I think they're more likely to be solution orientated. Thinking about what we can create together, this is about co-creation and co-authoring. Working with a partner organization, working with a network to co-author and co-create a future which is bigger and better than we could create on our own. Being motivated by what we're seeking to achieve rather than what we're seeking to avoid, what we don't want to happen. I think the person in this space who's thinking here is more likely to be open, more likely to be sharing. I think this is transformational leadership. I think this is transactional leadership. Someone in our organization says we want this, and we say, okay, we'll provide it for you. Become a supplier, not a business partner, not a colleague. This is a different conversation, moving from transactional to transformational, based upon what we can create together, motivated by what we're seeking to achieve. Let me give you another example of think, feel, and act. Um, here's an example for you. Uh, I was in a bar not so long ago. You may find it hard to believe, but I was. And I was talking to someone about what we do for a living. This is a true story. Chatting to this guy about what we do for a living, stranger. He said, I allow the future to take place. 
I regretted asking. <laughs> so, what do you mean? He said, I allow the future to happen and I shape communities. That's what I do. As it transpired, as it turned out, he was a fireman, firefighter. Quite liked it though when I thought about it. He does allow the future to happen. People now live who would have died. They go on to have children, go on to have children, go on to have children. He allows the future to happen. He shapes communities because buildings stand that would have been burnt to the ground. He thinks every single day when he walks to work, I allow the future to take place. I shape communities, I do. How do you think he feels when he walks through the door of his office? Does anyone need to tell him how to act or behave in front of a customer, in front of a colleague? I think not. And the reason why is that he doesn't define himself by what he does. He defines himself by the value he creates for other people. His contribution to humanity. Let's think big, why not? It's a big room. His contribution to communities. There's nothing interesting, engaging, exciting about our job titles. Job roles, job descriptions, they're all boring, every single one. What's truly engaging and exciting is what we do for other people, our contribution, how we make other people's lives better. That's truly exciting and engaging. That's truly interesting. If you want to mobilize talent in your teams, you need to move them away from the immediacy of their to-do list. Get your team members away from their to-do list. They define themselves by their job title and job role not making the connection between two things which are usually unconnected, which is what we seek to do and what we seek to create, particularly for others. It's becoming increasingly important that we do that. I would love to be in a bar, go up to a stranger, say, what do you do for a living? They said, I'm in the business of saving lives. Oh yeah, you're a doctor. No, 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 I'm an accountant. Oh, I see. I work in a hospital, and what I do is I come in every day, I look at the facts and figures. I make calculations based upon how many lives I can save that day. I go for the maximum number, I use the data, I use the insight, make sure I'm saving as many lives as I can that day. Wouldn't that be amazing? As opposed to the person they sit next to, who is in the business of cost reduction. Same job title, same job role. How they apply their talents quite different though, isn't it? You've got account managers, account directors, account execs, sales guys, commercial guys, product developers. How they do their job is quite different, isn't it? Even though the job title and job role is the same. And the reason why, not because of their skills, but because of how they see the value in what they're doing, the value point. The value point is where a customer meets our organization. How we see that determines what we end up doing. By the way, not only is it important for us to do it as an individual, as a leader, to move away from being a CIO, CTO, data manager. Move away from that. Think about the value you're creating at, uh, rather than a job title or job role that you're inheriting. It's important for us not to do that just as an individual, but as an organization now, and I'll tell you for why. People who believe that they're in the horse and carriage business, they lost their businesses overnight when the motor car was invented. They didn't realize they were in the business of effective transportation. People who believe they're in the telegraph business lost their businesses overnight when a telephone was invented. They didn't realize they were in the business of effective communication. What business are you in? It's a really good question, by the way. Go back and ask your team members. You can do it for your department. You've got an IT, a technology department, data department, analytics department. You can do it for your department. You can do it for your organization too. What business are you in? If people define it by core proposition, they're mistaken. No one buys retail. No one buys banking. No one buys insurance. No one buys any of those things. Something else, isn't it? And we need to define ourselves not by what we sell, but by what the customer values. By the way, that's a really important point, guys. Many organizations are struggling to do it at the moment. We need to define ourselves not by what we sell, but by what the customer values. It's a big difference between what we sell and what a customer buys. Even bigger difference between what we sell and what a customer values. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a customer of a bank. So I'm a customer of a bank. Do you know what I buy from my bank? Customer. I buy a good night's sleep. That's what I buy. I buy freedom. I buy independence. I buy choice. 
That's what I buy. That's what I'm after from my bank. My finances, I want freedom, I want independence, I want choice, I want a good night's sleep. That's all I'm after. I don't care about the products. What do banks do? I'm not being unfair to banks, by the way. I work with a lot of banks. Do you know what they do? Start to grow their business from the inside out. Talk about margin, revenue, product development, distribution channels, new markets, trading metrics. That's what they talk about. They don't define themselves by what a customer is valuing. They define themselves by what they're trying to sell. Maybe it's the reason why PayPal wasn't invented by a bank. It's very funny, that, by the way. Unless you work in banking, it's not funny. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh. The reason why is that banks had the networks, they had the history, they had the contacts, they had everything. It took someone outside the sector to give us as customers what we wanted. To be truly customer-centric, it came outside of financial services. Let's not pick on banks. Skype, not invented by anyone, telecommunications. Why on earth would telecommunications companies of the 80s and 90s boom give away for free? Well, they were making most money on at the time. It took someone outside the sector to give us what we wanted. Spotify, not invented by anyone in the music industry. It took someone outside the sector to give us what we wanted. Truly customer-centric. I guess you could say now that there is an entrepreneur somewhere forging a bullet with your company name on it. Can't dodge that bullet, by the way. You do have to fire first. Companies are good at being better. They're bad at being different. I see that all the time. You can argue now that companies which were born for success in the 20th century, by definition, are bred for failure in the 21st. Not change catching organizations out. It's the pace of change which is catching organizations out. That's the problem. And you cannot trust the future to anyone who champions the past. The curse of incumbency. These are the guys we've always used. This is how it should be in this particular area. Why on earth would we do something different? It's working. The curse of incumbency. The future demands us to be different. The only way we can be different and truly future relevant, truly future literate, is not to define ourselves by what we sell, but by what a customer values. <laughs> the principle of think, feel, and act. I'm not sure if that's of any use to you. I thought I'd spend more time on that one, and I think there might be one word, one sentence, one idea that might be of use to you. Let me share this with you, though. I shared this with a golfer. He was 117th in the world. He got into the top 17 just doing this. He did the Covey principle of E plus R equals O. That's what he did. The event plus the reaction equals the outcome. The event plus the reaction equals the outcome. The event is it will rain when you want it to be sunny. The event is children will run when you tell them to walk. The event is um, projects will be delayed. Budgets will change. The event is uh, you'll be sat next to someone today who you don't like. <laughs> Sometimes see people looking back, <laughs> nodding. Didn't see that today. But, uh, the event is um, new technology will fail. That will happen. I'm rubbish with new technology myself. I bought a book on the internet the other day. It was called How to Live with Really Shitty Neighbors. Unfortunately, I was out when it was delivered. The event is your wife, Tammy, will come to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning drunk when you've got a really early start next day. <laughs> Bit of personal therapy. Thank you. I will tell you the story, actually, if I've got time. Um, uh, can I run over by five minutes? Is that OK? Five minutes. Thank you. Um, I will tell you the story. My wife, Tammy, has got this friend, Nikki. Nikki's an idiot. <laughs> and Nikki, Nikki goes out with dreadful men, awful men. So the relationship ends and she comes over to our house and cries. And so Nikki and Tammy will drink till three o'clock in the morning. Put the world to rights. Anyway, so Tammy and Nikki get together a few weeks ago. They get drunk together. Tammy comes, wakes me up. It's three o'clock in the morning. She comes to bed. She wakes me up. Says, have you got an early start tomorrow? <laughs> Only a drunk person will wake you up in the middle of the night to ask if you are getting up early in the morning. So I said, yes, I've got an early start. I'm doing a talk 
They were taught for Bupa at the time, medical insurance. Anyway, and then she goes, brushes her teeth, comes back five minutes later, I have fallen asleep again. She wakes me up, wakes me up and says, what's your talk about? <laughs> Why do you want to know that in the middle of the night? I said to her that my talk, my talk is about my favorite sports people. And at the moment, I'm thinking O.J. Simpson. <laughs> yeah. Go to sleep. Covey called it reaction. I call it response. Ability. Our ability to respond. Can you imagine people in your teams now who had huge levels of response ability? An ability to respond to circumstance and situation no matter what, to drive the best outcomes or opportunities. Wouldn't that be amazing? You come away from here having connected and networked. I found out more about Exosol, a town and a way in which they are driving sustainable success in the future for you. Come away talk to your teams, and they have huge levels of response ability, genuine ownership over your new ideas and new ways of working to drive the best opportunities and outcomes. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be incredible? I don't believe in circumstance and situation, the things that push and pull us in different directions. The things that we say get in the way, inhibitors to success. How can I perform when? This is a circle of concern water cooler conversations. This is the circle of influence. And as leaders, we need to spend our time in here, particularly in a changing environment. We must learn to dance on a shifting carpet, not see the rug being pulled from under our feet. Things change all the time. The world is complex, it's uncertain, it's unpredictable. So what? Makes no difference. We need to understand our true power lies in here. I don't believe in circumstance or situation. I believe in choice. We know of people born into privilege. They had great role models. Access to love, access to education. Some of those people died heroin addicts in prison. Some people were born with a physical disadvantage. They had a lack of good role models, a lack of access to education and opportunity. They grew up to be some of the most important people and successful people who have ever walked this earth. It proves beyond doubt that attitude is more important than intelligence or facts. All the work I've done in high performance, I genuinely believe that to be true. Attitude is more important than intelligence or facts. Give me I will over IQ any day, any one of my teams. High technical expertise is no longer as valuable as it was. The reason why is that you can Google things. Lots of people have high technical expertise these days. It's the partner organizations you work with, suppliers, people who mobilize knowledge in a different way, allow you different insight, allow you different ways of understanding your business, drive the best results and outcomes. And that's not from technical knowledge, it's partnering, working together, building a depth of relationship, which is more to do with character and attitude than it is with process and mechanics. I say that blame looks backwards and responsibility looks forwards. That's a universal law, by the way. Blame looks backwards, responsibility looks forwards. We can blame anyone and everyone in here. We can blame capital markets, market needs, changing consumer buying behaviors. We can blame service level agreements, competition, globalization, compliance, governance, regulatory affairs. We can blame procurement. We can blame uh, HR. So take it back, it probably was their fault. I'm only joking. Blame each other, blame our parents. I had someone say to me a few weeks ago, said, of course I've got a temper. Of course I get angry. My dad was from Scotland. <laughs> Ludicrous, ridiculous thing to say. No genetic predisposition, it's not true. Do you have any Scottish people in today? <laughs> it's not. It's not true, I promise not true. There's no genetic disposition, so. I love the Scottish accent. It's a lovely accent, isn't it, a Scottish accent? It's a really nice accent. It's a sort of cross between English and alcohol. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. My point is, let's get back on track. My point is, it's not about circumstance and situation, it's about what we choose to do with it to drive the best outcomes or opportunities. The world is complex, the world is uncertain, the world is unpredictable. Always has been, by the way. Don't spend too long in the next two days talking about Brexit and Trump. And how people talk about the improbability of the world at the moment. It's always been improbable. Trump is probably the big one when it comes to improbable. Improbable that he got in, 
improbable now that he's there and the things that he's doing. I'll take you back though. Take you back to the 13th of September, 2001. If we were all in Washington at 3.40 p.m. in the afternoon, we would have heard President George Bush speak. He would have said, we will find those responsible for this atrocity. We will deal out swift and appropriate justice. He then said the chilling words, we'll also find those who harbored them. And they too will be dealt out swift and appropriate justice. We'd have stood there with two and a half thousand other people. And you may have clapped. I wouldn't have done, but you may have clapped. If I had to lean over to you and whisper in your ear at the end of that 22 minute speech, the next president of the United States will come from a Muslim background, have a Muslim name. Two days after 9-11, would you have put money on that? Barack Hussein Obama, his father was brought up in a Muslim household. Stepfather, actually, also brought up in a Muslim household. Two days after 9-11, how many people would have bet on that one? Next president of the United States, have a Muslim name, come from a Muslim background. If I had to say to you, the fastest growing religion in Texas in the next 18 months after 9-11 attacks, President George Bush's home state would be Islam. Would you believe me? Incredible, isn't it? What an amazing fact that is. If I had to say to you, in spring 2008, by Christmas time, the British banking system would all be but nationalized. Do you believe me? If I had to say to you that sometime in your lifetime, Leicester City would win the English Premiership. <laughs> Thought I was fucking bonkers. But, but, isn't it amazing? If I had to say to you that in the 18 months that followed the 9-11 um, attacks, that every single one of the world's major airlines will lose as much money as they have made in collective profit since their inception. It's a phenomenal fact that. Yeah, what, well, you'd say it never happened. It's impossible. So what, does it make any difference? And uh, the reason why those things are true and yet made no difference is because people chose to think in a particular way to drive the best outcomes or opportunities. By the way, opportunities are never lost. That's a real fallacy. Opportunities are never lost. They're simply found by someone else. Someone else who chose to think differently, even though their circumstance was the same. They had the same um, budget, same time sales, same uh, restructure, same organization, same metrics. Just chose to mobilize their technology, their people, their suppliers and partners in a way, drive the best outcomes or opportunities. Principle of E plus R equals O. And finally, and finally, I just want to share this really in the last five minutes or so with you. Um, and the reason why I think this is important is that not only is it important to your next 18 months, it's really important to your next two days. Guarantee you. At, um, get your head around this for the next two days. At, uh, I promise you will have a different experience here. Um, in fact, everything you're looking to achieve in the next 18 months is at the mercy of this next one thing. Sport you play, relationship you're in, something you want to do in business or your career, I guarantee you, is at the mercy of this. I think this is the greatest inhibitor of human performance. Nothing holds us back more than this. Because you've been so good allowing me to kick off your day, I'm just going to tell you this in the form of a story. So feel free to loosen your ties, kick off your shoes. I'll do the work from here. 1978, a series of experiments were done at Chicago University by a very clever man called Professor Sedgwick. He placed three steps in a cage. He placed an electric plate on the middle step, which delivered a mild electric shock for the animal lovers in the room. Place some bananas here, cold shower here. He placed two monkeys in the cage. These are monkeys. Two rude monkeys, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. Turn it into a tail. Actually, I think it looks worse, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know what to do. It looks worse turning it into a tail. I'm sorry. It's a tail. I'm not redrawing it. It's gone red now. I don't know. It's gone horribly wrong. Last five minutes, it's gone horribly wrong. Fine. But, um, two rather excited monkeys in the cage. See the bananas? He runs up here, runs up here. Ah, electric shock! The smell of burnt fur. His friend gets the cold shower. And monkeys hate cold water. What did you learn today? What happens now? He's patting out his foot. He is wringing out his tail. Go again. He goes up here, goes up here. Ah, electric shock! Smell of burnt fur. 
His friend gets the cold shower, and monkeys hate cold water. This is where it gets interesting. Professor Sedgwick puts in another monkey, slightly less aroused. He comes in, says, bananas will have them. These two monkeys run in front and say, no, it's impossible. It can't be done. Don't do it. They bite, they pinch, they scratch, they box. Stop him from getting the bananas. I worked with Lennox Lewis once. Do you know Lennox Lewis? Heavyweight boxer. Um, do you know why it is that boxers don't have sex before fights? It's because they don't usually find each other attractive. <laughs> You've got to ask the, right, ask the right questions when you, when you work with sports people. What happens now is that where it gets very interesting. Professor Sedgwick takes out the electric plate. He takes out the cold shower. He takes out the two original monkeys. This monkey has never had a cold shower or electric shock in his entire life. The two elements are not even in the cage. Another monkey comes in, says bananas. He runs in front and says, no, it's impossible, don't do it. They bite, they pinch, they scratch, they box. Stop him from getting the bananas. This is replicated with third and fourth and fifth generation monkeys thereafter. This is a story of belief system. What we believe to be true. The map is not the territory. We do three things with all information that comes our way. We delete, we distort, and we filter in accordance to our own belief system. So you'll have presentations afterwards, Aaron, Tyus. You'll have presentations uh, today, tomorrow, and um, you will delete, distort, filter in accordance to your own belief system, what you believe is true. Sit there, watch facts and figures, analysis, People do it with data and insight all the time, don't they? Delete and distort and filter in accordance to their own belief system. The shame of it is that we always prove ourselves right, even when we're wrong. That's the problem. Whatever your viewpoint is on immigration, refugees, whatever your viewpoint is on BMW drivers, whatever your viewpoint is on the competition, globalization, new technologies, products, pricing points, Whatever your viewpoint is on uh, your various teams, colleagues, whatever your viewpoint is, digital disruption, AI, AR, robotics, 3D printing, whatever your viewpoint is on yourself, you are wrong, but you'll always prove yourselves right. Always look for the evidence to fit. That's what we do. The world reflects back, treats us as we treat it. How many times have you heard someone say, I will be nice to him, when he's nice to me. The only way in which you change your outer world is to change your inner world. It's the only way in which it can be done. So many times people will live by a particular belief system and you need to be careful in the next two days. You'll hear all sorts of great things. Sit there and think, you know what, well, that's all very well, but that wouldn't work in my geography. My team's different. My customers are different. No, at, um, no one would buy that length of contract and that geography. It doesn't work like that. We sit there and we delete and distort and filter and live in a world of our own making. Future demands us to be open-minded. The more you can engage in an open-minded manner in the next two days, the more benefit there is to you, rather than moving into our belief system. Simply believing things and uh, looking for the evidence to prove ourselves right. I promise you the hardest thing that I do in business or in sport is try to convince people that the world that they are experiencing is merely a reflection of their own attitude towards it. Guarantee you, it's the hardest thing that I do. Sarkin Vili was a Hungarian psychiatrist. He did some amazing work into human belief system, incredible work into human belief system. He studied things like um, a, sort of a principle of why do we prove ourselves right even when we're wrong. So he studied things like um, voodoo, faith healing, reincarnation, stuff that relies on a belief system. I was at Miami airport a few weeks ago. I had one of those Hare Krishna people come up to me sometimes get them at American airports. He said, do you believe in reincarnation? I said, not you again. <laughs> it's, it's a confusion technique, use it, it works. I promise they don't like it, use it, it works. And then, but anyway, Sarkin Vili had a patient who believed he was a corpse, a patient who believed he was a dead body. But what can I possibly do? I know, I've got it. One day the patient comes to see the psychiatrist. 
Psychiatrist says to the patient, do you still believe you're dead? The patient said, of course I'm dead. Can't you see that I'm dead? Psychiatrist said, okay then. Do you believe that dead bodies bleed? The patient got angry. Of course a dead body cannot bleed. You're a man of science. You know the answer to this. Why are you wasting my time? Dead bodies do not bleed. And everyone knows a dead body cannot bleed. At that point, the psychiatrist grabbed a pin, stuck it straight into the patient's hand. Sure enough, he bled. What did the patient say? My word, I didn't know. Dead bodies do bleed. <laughs> we prove ourselves right, even when we're wrong, we'll always find the evidence to fit. This is why we need to be careful. It's tricky though, isn't it? Because we all think differently anyway. Different mindsets, different belief systems, different ways of seeing the world. You've all had the same evidence of me today. I've said the same words for all of you. I've worn the same clothes for all of you. You've all had the same evidence of me, the same experience of me. Um, someone over there will think he's a fabulously engaging, charismatic, knowledgeable, good-looking speaker. Whereas someone over here will think exactly the same. <laughs> I'm tired. It's a bad example. Here's a better example for you. Better example is, if I said describe the room, you could describe the room. If I said stand on a chair, describe the room, you would describe it differently. So the evidence is the same, the perspective is different. Do you think there's people in your business who could be better? Yes. And not by learning new technology, learning new languages. They could be better simply by seeing themselves differently. So maybe your role at a, as a leader is not to try and give people the right answers. Maybe try and ask the right questions. Move people into a different belief system. And finally, your final minute. <laughs> Professor Sedgwick found out that one in 78 monkeys was the rogue monkey. One in 78. I cannot tell you the value of a rogue monkey in your organization. If you have one, allow them to forage for nuts and berries and exhibit natural behavior. A rogue monkey who chose not to believe the evidence. A rogue monkey who simply climbed the steps, started eating bananas. I don't know what that looks like in your organization, rogue monkey behavior. I do know it's essential. Maybe it's greater curiosity over the next couple of days. Maybe it's greater levels of challenge with each other, greater levels of open-mindedness. And I don't know what it is which will allow you to future-proof your organization, but I know it can only come from thinking differently. The future demands us to be different. You cannot predict the future but you can be ready for it. Form a community with a purpose, work with good suppliers, good partners, form a network based upon a depth of relationship, heading towards a relationship which is mutually beneficial. This is my email address. I give this out at every single talk that I do. It is jamil at jamilcrashey.com. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour is never enough to talk about performance. Um, if you um, want to ask me any questions whatsoever about um, E plus R equals O in a dialogue, something about your team, feel free. And, uh, it takes me up to two weeks to get back to emails. I get a lot of emails. Um, I do a lot of traveling, uh, but I do reply to every single one. My Twitter address, you want to mail me through Twitter? Um, mail me through Twitter, it's just Jamil underscore Crashey. Jamil underscore Crashey, you can mail me through Twitter um, or mail me here. It's private and personal, feel free to mail. I thank you ever so much for your time this morning. I know that you're going to have a great couple of days. Um, please connect and engage with each other, make the most of it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>